exposures. Okay. And to mention basically what it can do. Okay. Uh, basically what happened here, uh, exposure, which can, means that exposure, which can, as a matter of fact, uh, just put the point here, for example, irritate. Irritate and damage. Okay, membranes of the eye. Of the eye. And also a an, uh, respiratory system. Okay, and also, and it could cause basically the loss of the lung function and cause, okay, some loss of lung uh, function, okay. And also to mention the other point here also, that also exposure uh, to ozone, okay, uh, can result, okay, in asthmatic attack, Attack, okay, and also can modify basically also uh, what you call like bronchitis and emphysema, and can and I call we can exacerbate, exacerbate, okay, bronchitis. and emphysema. Okay. Usually going to put down here, basically with the, with the human, as a matter of fact, we have here the guideline. Okay. Uh, for long, uh, say, uh, exposure, something, okay. Is about, Hundred part per billion. Okay, and of course, some people could be even because people vary in their sensitivity. Huh? People could be some of them sensitive could be that too much for them. Okay, and also they put about this is for long exposure and three hundred part per billion. This is for a short term exposure and the average uh, three hundred part per billion for short-term exposure. Okay. However, as I mentioned to you here, uh, sensitivity of people always uh, differ, and it could be even less than that. It depends on many other factors. And now also to mention that ozone also can damage uh, uh, vegetation and so on. And uh, to mention this point here also, let's talk about uh, in case of a human here, ozone also, okay, uh, causes, okay, 
uh, important damage. Okay, uh, to wild uh, life. and also to agriculture. Okay. Over a wide spread area. Called wide uh, spread. This is white spread areas. Okay, I think. Um, sorry, what that here? To mention to something here, I guess. And uh, to mention also that. Uh, to mention also one point here that distinctive foliar injury that means occur to the leaves that as a matter of fact it will diminish what you call the ability of the leaf to do photosynthesis. Uh, to mention to you here uh, this also cause distinctive okay foliar uh, injuries Okay, uh, that diminishes. Okay, that diminish what you call the photosynthetic capacity of plant. of plants, okay? Uh, usually to, uh, to mention some of the guideline here, okay? Uh, or what, for example, acute injury, Okay, are caused uh, to most species okay uh, simply by say two uh, to four hour to four hours exposures. to almost to 200, an average of 200 to 300 part per billions, okay? This is, of course, for a short period, okay? But for long period, well, long exposure, okay? to only uh, 40 to 100 part per billion may cause, sorry, what you call, what you call, hidden injuries, may cause hidden injuries Okay, and also and reduce the yield, means the, the production. Okay, you got that? So basically, this is a, a, a very summarized uh, point to mention about the toxicity, of course, of the ground level ozone. Okay. 
or we call it the toposphere ozone. And now we're going to talk about a little bit about the stratosphere ozone and how it's being produced. Okay, so still I'm talking about that. So basically, here's subtitle: uh, stratosphere ozone. or stratospheric ozone. Okay. Uh, so, okay, before I go basically that is, so, uh, just give me a second here. This is it, uh, how it, it looks like, basically, the ozone damage plant, okay? Uh, the leaves, it shows you just an example to uh, uh, that, of course, of the, what you call the ground level ozones, okay? And that's basically by doing all that, definitely uh, is going to affect too much the capability of the need to do photosynthesis or so on, okay? Just to give you an idea. <laughs> Now we talk about the stratospheric ozone, basically the way it's being formed in the, uh, in the uh, atmosphere and also to mention, of course, you know, because it has a lot of beneficial in contrast to that of what you call of the uh, ground ozone. Now, the ozone is produced, to mention this point, ozone is produced. Okay. In the stratosphere. Okay. Uh, simply to mention, by natural reactions. Okay, by natural reactions. Okay, and basically these reactions, what they will do, okay, which simply, uh, and these involves Okay, involve the absorption okay, of solar ultraviolet radiation So these basically involve the absorption of the solar ultraviolet uh, valued, uh, radiation, okay, by oxygen molecule. As you know, the oxygen molecule is O2. And that's basically the result in the end to join with other oxygen molecule, and then in that case, of course, Well, somebody asked me, I don't know, you should ask me immediately. Okay, now. Uh, Radiation by oxygen molecule, okay, forming highly reactive, forming, okay, <clears throat> highly reactive. Okay, this one here. Okay, this is reactive here. Okay, did you follow that? And basically, been the sort of okay, by oxygen molecule absorber, which is forming a highly reactive oxygen atom. oxygen atom, which is O, that I join with other O2 molecules that
okay uh, join with other O2 molecules to form okay O3 And usually these occur in the stratosphere quite quickly because there is quite a bit of energy there. Uh, to mention this point here now, these reactions the proceeds okay, basically relatively quickly. quickly in the stratosphere. They will develop very quickly in the stratosphere as a matter of fact, because high energy because of the high energy ultraviolet radiation is abundant. Is abundant there, means in the in this stratosphere. And that's where basically, and as a result, uh, if you finish on this one, I'm going to put it here. Okay. As a result, okay, that the O3 concentration are typical or typically Okay, are typically around, of course, 200 uh, to 300 part per billion in the stratosphere. Okay, into the strato uh, sphere. which is basically, which is about uh, 10 times higher okay, than in the ambi ambient, means, okay, ambient, the troposphere. Okay. And now, of course, uh, already you know basically what you call the uh, the stratosphere ozone has a lot of services. Okay, and to mention this point here now, uh, stratosphere ozone. Okay, ozone uh, provide, as a matter of fact, a critical, okay, environmental or environment services. services, okay? 
Uh, one of these, of course, are, are good to mention in the point. Of course, as you know, uh, it absorbs a lot of this ultraviolet radiation, which is really damaging, okay? So basically, it, to mention this point, it efficiently, it efficiently, okay, it efficiently absorb, okay, most high energy, <clears throat> the ultraviolet radiation, which is, as you know, it's very damaging to, okay, radiation, uh, simply just to mention, which can be extremely damaging. Okay. Uh, the other point I'm going to mention to you here also, and of course this is a, 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 as a matter of fact that because the ultraviolet you can put it down yourself also because it can cause the what you call skin cancer, it can increase the risk of skin cancer. Okay, and also increase what you call of melania, melanoma, and often other fatal diseases. Okay, that is already, you know these things, but I'm going to mention other thing. Now, other health risk, okay, uh, from ultraviolet exposure, Uh, simply include what is known as include the development okay of cataracts I'm going to explain it to you okay Uh, cataracts, that's basically explained to you here. Uh, basically, this is what you call as a medical condition. Okay, in which the lens, okay, of the eye. Okay. becomes, we call it progressively, opaque. Okay. And uh, it gives as a matter of fact what you call the impact. In that case, it gives as a matter of fact what you call a blurred vision, okay? Resulting in a blurred vision, okay? <clears throat> Uh, plus, of course, the other point to mention, of course, that also ultraviolet, as a matter of fact, radiation, which is already mentioned that, okay, also uh, damage, okay, plant. And damage plant also because what happened here really it, uh, it has a great, great impact on the chlorophyll itself. Okay, to mention uh, also damage plants because the chlorophyll okay uh, can be uh, 
degrade it by ultraviolet absorption. Okay. In general, of course, as I mentioned to you, in general, the plant, as a matter of fact, all the time, especially when, especially uh, if you see in this plant, which they grow in, uh, in in arid condition or area in which basically there is a lot of sunlight, okay, or heavy sunlight, you, you find, for example, the epidermis, and instead of becoming one layer, it would be many, many layers, okay? And of course, one of the reasons, you remember, for example, when you make a cross-section in the leaf, okay what you find you find most of these plant of the dicot as a matter of fact they have as a matter of fact what you call the palisade layer you remember that okay you have the palisade layer and basically the whole orientation of the palisade layer when you have like this one or the palisade layer which is the cell like this all that is a matter of fact it, it try to reduce as much as possible what you call the chlorophyll or the, the chloroplast inside to the sunlight, okay? Of course, in case, of course, when you have uh, uh, like grasses, the grasses usually, you don't find the palisade layer, but you find also because the leaf, as a matter of fact, is very thin and also reflective. So basically the plant, as a matter of fact, they try to avoid in general, just to mention to you here, what you call excessive sunlight, okay? So that's why, uh, ultraviolet radiation could be very damaging uh, to the chlorophyll, okay? And even uh, just to add to that, uh, as you know, because when you, uh, as a photosynthetic pigment, you have the chlorophyll, and when you mention a pigment, what means a pigment? A pigment usually be defined as a, a structure which can absorb the wavelength at uh, the ultraviolet or sort of the light at certain wavelength. That is the pigment. Okay, as you know, most of these chlorophyll pigment they absorb within the about 600 or less what you call nanometers. But also, you find also with the chlorophyll, you have a lot of other pigment like carotene, xanthophyll, and all others. All these basically, of course, they absorb the light at different wavelengths, and their main importance is to dissipate the what you call the wavelength. So basically, in the plant, they do quite a bit of modification and basically try to reduce the impact of the high uh, uh, light uh, uh, energy, okay, in general. Now, also mentioned that ultraviolet damage plant chlorophyll can be degraded by ultraviolet, what you call uh, absorption, okay? So basically the same. Now, to mention other point here, of course, that this is to mention, because as a matter of fact, we're talking about that this is stratosphere or zone, basically will make a barrier for this ultraviolet, which is very, very important uh, for these living organism in which to be uh, less damaged. Now to mention other thing also, that uh, as you know, basically to talk about what is the thing will destroy the ozone or the stratospheric ozone. Now, to mention that, uh, Stratospheric ozone okay, also can be destroyed okay, by various processes. Okay. Now, I'm going to put it here in a few points. What are these? Uh, for example, including okay, including uh, reactions basically with the trace gases. These three guys you mentioned as uh, the nitric oxide complex, remember this one here, and also add NO2, okay, and to be destroyed also 
and width. Okay. And with reaction, okay, reaction with, we we'll call it with reactive ions of chlorine. Okay, bromine and fluorine. Did you follow that? Okay, and that's why basically it's believed that basically these gases, which we call freons, okay, are very destructive as a matter of fact of what you call for this automation, uh, this point here. It is widely believed okay, that emissions of of this compound known as a chlorofluorocarbon. Chloro fluorocarbon, which is we call it CFC3. Okay. CFC3, okay, uh, particularly what is known the industrial okay, gases which is basically which is known as freons. Okay. Now, what happened here? Because these guys are going to, to explain why this effect. Because these guys basically are unreactive gases. So, what happened here? Uh, they can uh, travel to the what you call. Uh, to the troposphere and in the end they can reach to the stratosphere and then when they reach to the stratosphere basically by the impact of the ultraviolet they become very active and destroy the ozone to mention this point here now okay to make put down now because as you mentioned to you that this guys which is known as the cfc3 Okay, are extremely <laughs> okay, and reactive in the troposphere. They are unreactive in the troposphere, okay, and that's why in the end they they migrate, as a matter of fact, to the uh, stratosphere. And to mention this point, and they eventually, okay, migrate, okay, uh, up to the stratosphere. I'm going to continue here to the to the stratosphere. Okay, where they are. 
bombarded okay with the ultraviolet radiation okay and of course and slowly degrade the release of called a free chlorine And basically when that chlorine will come, that chlorine will react as a matter of fact, uh, it's very uh, react and destroy well, as a matter of fact, the ozone. And to mention this point that the chlorine, okay, efficiently, Okay, of Antarctic or the Arctic winter. Okay. And that's why basically sometime they occur, uh, these ozone holes sometime in the early spring, okay? And these, to make this point here, and these polar focused ozone, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, depletion, and to mention that these polar uh, focused uh, depletions, okay, result, as already may be heard, and the development what is known as of the of the so-called, we call it some time ago, of the so-called ozone holes.
during the early spring. Okay. And basically this has, uh, of course, been observed as a matter of fact, very extensively during the 1980s. And since then, of course, when they realized this, okay, and to mention this uh, phenomena here. Of course, these phenomena, phenomena observed regularly. Okay. These phenomena observed uh, regularly uh, since the early 1980s. when we have basically the holes over Antarctica which is basically are particularly extensive and typically okay involve the decreases in uh, as I mentioned to you in total ozone concentration. Okay. Concentration almost about 30 to 50 percent during the uh, okay, to make sure of 30 to 50 percent, okay, during the spring. Okay. And basically what happened here seems the, uh, that whole of the ozone, you can put it down for yourself here, that simple to mention that the affected areas, okay, in the Northern hem Hemisphere was much, much smaller than that was occurring, what you call in the Antarctic. Did you follow that? Okay, I'm going to give you some statistic here about that hole of the ozone. It seems okay to mention to you here uh, some of these progressive, which has happened here. Okay, now. Uh, to make, could you move the page up? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Now, may I ask you, how big you can see it in this in your screen? I have no idea. Uh, right now we can see uh, three big, lines below spring, and okay, I, because really I don't know how big it to the area you can see it there, and that's why sometimes it's uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, well, anyway, and now just to okay, just uh, always notify me, please don't worry about that when you don't see it, okay, so that I will know. Uh, now, just to give you some statistic about these, the sizes in there occur between 1980s to 1991 and then how about it? Now, the sizes of the ozone hole Okay, holes because I mean, they are very 
and from year to year. Okay, and usually say between uh, say uh, 1991 and uh, 2007, okay, uh, the ozone hole Okay, uh, typically, okay, exceeded okay, uh, almost like 220, sorry, 20 million square kilometer each year. Okay, you see, uh, did you follow that? This is almost like a 20 kilometer, the holes. So, uh, base, uh, however, uh, comparing that when it was basically in 1979 uh, or uh, around 80s, it was almost only two to three, as a matter of fact, million kilometers, square kilometer, same. Okay, to making this point here. So between 1991 and 2007, the ozone hole typically exceeded 20 million square kilometer each year. Okay. And as I mentioned, you compared. Okay. Um, with two to three million uh, square kilometer between what you call 1979 and 1982. Okay, uh, this is of course according to the uh, to the National Weather Services. Okay, and it seems in 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 year 2000 it was basically that hole was the, the ever was the largest. I mentioned to you to here now in 2000 or in year 2000. Okay, uh, the largest ever uh, ozone hole uh, occurred. Okay, and as a matter of fact, at the time reached like 30 million square kilometer occurred. Okay, almost covering almost 30 million uh, square kilometer, okay? <laughs> and now basically, uh, the this okay. Uh, now, uh, the last item I'm going to talk about in what you call with this section of the gaseous, what you call the air, uh, is this basically air pollution and health. And we talk about also the area in which basically we had quite a bit of smog, which killed many, many people at the time. So basically subtitled here, air pollution and health. Okay. Now, as already you know, for example, basically uh, coal uh, has long been uh, 
uh, used around. The word. Okay. Of course, to heat homes. And other buildings. Okay. But really, of course, is uh, uh, the call that basically all, all what happened here, especially when happened what you call started really uh, since, as you know, the industrial revolution. Okay, and to mention to you at this point, uh, it, it, it is emission in the cities and towns in Europe. in Europe has caused okay a problem or problems since at least 1500 okay so basically basically when they closed okay And to mention, of course, with the beginning, with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, sorry, the beginning. of industrial uh, revolution okay and because of course what happened that we're initially using only coal at the time which initially used coal as its a principle energy source look at it take this out here for a second here Okay. Simple energy source. Okay. And then, of course, since that, as a matter of fact, then the pollution. No. Uh, of course, what happened in the beginning, the, the point I, uh, to mention the subtitle, uh, uh, what you call. Uh, how we try to link when it happened, the link between pollution and health. And that basically the, the idea of this uh, subtitle at the moment to mention to you here now. The first convincing link to mention here. Uh, the first uh, convincing link uh, between that air pollution okay air pollution and increased and increased in the death okay 
and the death of an exposed okay the human population I think the fish from this one I put it here okay the human uh, population uh, basically the, that, that happened basically especially the first time that connection of care or bandit in Glasgow England uh, to mention this to you okay in Scotland sorry about that was made okay in relation okay uh, to Glasgow which is Scotland uh, basically that occurred basically in 1909 right where uh, at the time okay we're about Uh, a thousand deaths were attributed okay as a matter of fact uh, 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 to the noxious smog okay that develop okay during as you know we call it atmos atmospheric inversion which we talk about it and we explain it during and atmospheric Inversion. Okay. And also the same thing sometimes, uh, just to uh, show you something here. Okay. Uh, the smoke was really very, very bad. It looked quite like, I don't know if you can see the image here, or it looks like, okay, or uh, this area here, okay? And also happened in the state uh, to talk about it also. Now, and this is what they call, this is the killer smoke. And, and to mention also the other example here, and the most, okay, uh, most famous, Uh, killer called smog okay in North America okay occurred okay basically in uh, around basically in 1948. 1948 and in that area an area known as Donora in Pennsylvania okay in which basically what happened here a temperature Okay, called a temperature inversion. Okay, and fog almost persisted four days.
Okay, and also at the same time, but the emission from the factory is still continued in spite of all that. Okay, but emission. Okay, from uh, several uh, factories. Okay, continue. Okay, and just to give you a, okay, uh, and uh, uh, in this case, basically, what you call that the smog, okay, uh, resulted, okay, in increased. Uh, uh, mortality in the local population population okay uh, the plus to that also what happened here additional and additional also uh, 43 percent of the population became ill And almost out of this 10% uh, very severely, uh, and to mention 10% severely so. Okay. <clears throat> Of course, also happen uh, what, what you call in the also occurred in London, and to mention it, the smoke was so basically um, uh, was so heavy in that uh, particularly in this uh, during that time of the fifties or so on, fifty two, fifty three was so heavy that even people driving they lost their way, or people even wa were walking they fell in the river and so on. Okay, it happened so okay, so that basically since then that basically gives the connection between the, what you call, the pollution and the health on the human being and also the education. And to mention a few lines here after that, to talk about also that in the city here. Now, the, uh, now uh, to put this point, now the poor quality of urban air, Okay, quality. Urban air also uh, damaged vegetation. Okay, and also in, in, in many cities. Okay. Only certain species. Only certain species of plants. That tolerate. Okay, now that tolerate uh, 
एयर पोल्यूशन could you grow uh, because basically what happened here that when all that uh, pollution then always uh, what you call a species will do uh, 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 there was a lot of research to find even for example here when you have the tailing area and others and always try to find out to figure out which species amount of can it grow for example in a very acidic or very damaged kind okay now i just going to mention some of the plants in which basically it seems they are resistant to the pollution and they grow just important for you to note. Oh, okay, to mention this point. Okay, are you following this? All right, now, and to mention that example of pollution tolerated trees. Examples, okay, of pollution tolerant the trees okay that are commonly grow in urban Canada okay we include these species, okay? One known as Norway maple. Okay, Norway maple. And the Latin for it name is Acer Prentoides. Acer. Okay. Pretinoides. Okay. The other one, silver maple. Okay, which is basically Acer Sekram. The other species called Linden, this is the common name. And the Latin name for it is Telia. Okay, Europea. Okay. And also we have the other one was a tree of heaven. Okay. And perhaps here. Okay. And tree of heaven, which is basically the Latin name for it. Are you seeing this? Okay, called Alianthas altissima. Okay. And then also we have the other one is known as Jingogo, which is the Latin name for called Jingogo biloba. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, 
just uh, give me one second here uh, to show you the difference because you have this is the Norway maple do you see this one called the Norway maple and this other one is called silver maple this is one acer planta planetoides okay okay and this you see how the difference in the leaves for your information uh, this one here is the Norway maple okay do you see that the leaves here Okay, and this is basically the silver maple. The leaves will look like with the silver maple. Did you see that? Okay, just to give you an example here. And this is the other one here, basically to give you an example. Okay, uh, yeah, the linden. Okay, this is all Ortelia europea. This is the one here, how it looks like. Okay, and uh, this one here. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the tree of heaven, which is Alanthas altissima, okay, tree of heaven. The other one, I, of course, you should know basically the Jingo or Jingo Bailoba, which has the fine shaped leaf. Okay, so uh, by this basically, then I'm, uh, did you finish from this or not yet? Could you just move the page up a little bit? Okay. Is it okay like this? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, there is a lot of uh, cities as a matter of fact of this one here, but I'm not going to continue with this, but I'll finish this one section here. Okay. Do you finish now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, then basically, I will finish this section about what you call, we talk about it, which was important information for you to know about it here, in which basically we cover what you call the gaseous air pollution, uh, in which basically gives all the reaction, how it occurs. Now I'm going to move with you to another section. Of course, I'm going to start with you the next lecture, but we are going to, to deal with this one here. Okay. And also with the air. But as a matter of fact, we deal with this one here. The title is going to move to deal with is atmospheric gases and climate change. Okay, because in this one, basically, we talk about all the gases and how they react in the atmosphere and uh, we, we result all how the result basically all these reaction, which end up giving us what you call the greenhouse effect and so on. Okay, so we'll discuss all this one there. Okay, now, do you have any question, please? I just have a question about the essay. Does it have to be like a certain amount of pages? Uh, yes. Uh, this is we are talking about your what you call tutorial. Yeah. Yeah, because as a tutorial, really, as somebody asked me, and so the, uh, thank you for asking me, uh, should it be less than at least eight to ten pages? Okay, thank you. And that is does not include the what you call uh, the title, what you call the coverage page, and does not include the the literature cited or the references. Okay. Okay, and how far are we going with this? Are you doing okay now? Yeah, it's going good so far. All right. Okay, any more question, please? All right, well, that's basically, well, thank you for your attendance and I hope you uh, uh, understand the material. I know some of it maybe it's not that easy, okay, to deal with all that. And basically, the, I try to finish this one. I don't know how many <laughs> tourists. I want to finish this one. And also, I want to finish basically at least to get to the other part I want to talk about, especially about disposal of a lot of material and what is the best way uh, to dispose it. Okay. So, basically, next lecture, we will start with the atmospheric gases and the climate change. Okay. And okay. So, good day. And we'll talk to you next lecture. Bye bye. Okay, I'm going to end the session now.